Welcome. Was buying a car here in Thailand, which I desperately needed, a mistake on the Bitcoin standard when compared to renting a car? Well, I decided to throw together a spreadsheet to examine that fact. So, first off, let me try to show you the spreadsheet. Last July, we ended up buying a Mazda CX-30 SUV, small crossover SUV. Excellent car. I was tired of renting a car monthly, but I could have chosen to lease the car for a, like a two year term or a one year term and just do a lease. Now on this chart here, and I'm going to blow this up just a little so that we can get a little bigger. I spent flat money. There was incidentals and so forth. But let's say the car it was a 2021 with about 6,000 miles on it. I paid $26,471. I could have rented a similar vehicle, not exactly the same, but similar, for about $530 a month here. So here's the question I was posing. Are you better off taking your money and buying the car, a depreciating asset, or are you better off taking that money either putting it in or leaving it in Bitcoin. And every month, take the amount of the payment and sell just enough Bitcoin to make the payment. So here is what we did. In July of 2023, Bitcoin was in its winter cycle down from its sixty eight thousand dollar high down to around thirty thousand dollars that's volatility that's okay let me look you square in the eye here if you don't have a four year minimum investment horizon on Bitcoin don't get in it. If you're, if you're not willing to totally commit or commit whatever funds that you want to commit, I don't care if you want to commit one-tenth of one percent of your assets. If you don't think of it in a four-year minimum commitment to that investment, you may at some point be unhappy with your investment before four years has passed. No one has ever held in 15 years in any period, no matter what price they bought at and held it four years and not made good money. Better than any other asset if you held it four years. So, in July, it was Bitcoin was selling for thirty thousand four hundred sixty-five dollars, which means if I took rental amount, that equaled zero point eight six Bitcoin. Eh, no big deal. Rent the car. Next month, August, it was only worth twenty-nine thousand two hundred thirty dollars. Now subtract $500 worth of money from there and you will have sold 0.03 something Bitcoin and you'd only have 0.83 Bitcoin left at that point. 
and you would have a value of $24,338 in Bitcoin for that allotment. September, subtract another payment, and you would be down to 0 0.80 Bitcoin, and Bitcoin dropped to $25,934. October, Bitcoin was back up to almost $30,000, Take another payment off, you would be down to 0 0.798 Bitcoin, and it'd be about 23,000. So you're 3,000 behind what in value, but remember, even if you bought the car, which I did buy the car, but was that to my financial benefit? Let's just keep going here for a minute. By November, it was at 34,000. You dropped to 0 0.79 Bitcoin, but you had $27,519. So now you've rented the car for five months and you've got more money than you started with. A little less Bitcoin because you spent the money out of the Bitcoin. This is called living on Bitcoin standard. You keep it all in Bitcoin as much as you can and only pull out what you have to to live and pay your bills. So now in December, you're down 0 0.78 Bitcoin after you make another payment. And now you get $29,500. You're $3,000 ahead. Now, in January, the ETFs came out. But January 1st, this is before the ETFs were announced to be approved, Bitcoin was up to $42,280. And you only had 0.78%, or I mean 0.78 of a Bitcoin, but that's worth $33,000. February, price didn't change much. You were down to 0 0.76 Bitcoin. Okay. Now here, I want to Well, we jumped to 61000 for the value of Bitcoin in March, which meant after you took the $500 payment out and took the 0 0.76 Bitcoin out, you had 48383 That's the same formula I've been using. I'm not sure how that went up. Maybe there's a little fault in the formula. But this Bitcoin that I have is now worth 48000 April 1st, it was 71000 for the price of Bitcoin. So if you had a little more than three quarters of a Bitcoin, 56,000 in value, then drop back down to 60,000. So you're back down to 46,000. And on June 1st, it was 67,489. So you could have you could have rented the car for 12 months, taking the rental payments out of your Bitcoin, and instead of tw buying it for $26,471, you will have made your rent payments, and you'd actually have $52,000 in your pocket. Now, these numbers aren't perfect. I mean, they're all approximations because 
if you don't actually do it in real time and keep real good track of your expenses, you end up with stuff like that. But in round numbers, by keeping what at the time, 26,000 at the time was almost 0 0.86 Bitcoin. By keeping that 0 0.86 Bitcoin and only paying a small amount to rent, by the time you took the rental payments out, you're down here and you got about 0 0.77 of a Bitcoin, but that is worth 52,000. Now, some people say Bitcoin this cycle in the next three years could go, you know, 150, 300, 500, 1 million people were all over the chart. But I guarantee it's going to be a lot higher than this. So is it possible by spending $25,000 that you could have actually, in the three years later, actually have a car worth $15,000? Where you could have had Bitcoin worth 150 or 200 or 130,000 and still be renting your car at 500 a month. That's living on Bitcoin standard. These, this is food for thought. You know, right now, I am still. This is harder to do than you'd think because of in the United States of tax implications. You try to work it so you, you keep your keep your uh, movements within the tax law proper and stay in a favorable tax position as much as you can. So you slowly move into Bitcoin and out of all your other investments, which means selling things that may have been in a stock market that have long-term capital gains on them that have to have taxes paid. That's the price you pay to make a move like this. But as long as the government keeps borrowing money, selling bonds, selling notes, and debasing their currency, smart money from around the world is going to run to a hard, durable store of value. Now, there's a lot to learn about Bitcoin. And if you don't put in the time to do your own research, you're crazy. Do your own research. I've put in hundreds of hours. A lot of people say, put in 100 hours to research Bitcoin. i put in hundreds to a point where I am a believer. But in the long run, price of Bitcoin is going to go up because the entire world's based on non-supported fiat currency, which has been declared to be currency by governments that do not back this currency. Interesting fact here. Every current fiat currency in the world that a government prints at one time was backed by a precious metal. At one time, every fiat currency was backed by a precious metal. Gold mostly. But as the U.S. abandoned the gold standard and the gold backing for its currency and decided to just have non-backed currency, the rest of the world follows suit. And everybody is a debtor nation. There's very few non-debtor nations in the, in the entire world. Nations with zero debt. Very few. I'm not exactly sure which ones they are. Bahrain, maybe? Maybe the UAE? 
China used to be a nation that didn't have any debt. Now it's way in over its head. But none of this currency was ever brought out without the backing of physical gold or silver or something. Something backing a fiat currency to where they couldn't just keep on printing and debasing it. People may not know that back before the, in the early days of the American, of the United States, back in the late 1780s, they used to have a currency called a continental. That's where the term not worth a continental was from. During the Revolutionary War, I mean, back when, when costs were so low, they printed so much money, they took, the, they took the U.S. money supply from $12 million in 1774, 1775. And by the time that you added states printing their own currencies, banks printing their own currencies, and the federal and the U.S. government printing more continentals, they debased the currency to where it wasn't worth anything. It was literally untradeable. Which is the reason why when they wrote the Constitution, they said that all money needed to be backed by gold and silver. They knew what could happen by just printing money. They didn't know when they did it. They did it anyway, and it totally wrecked the economy for a while. Bitcoin is strong store of value. It's not a currency. Nobody wants to take Bitcoin and go buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks. It's not made for that. Now, if you want to live on Bitcoin standard, you can have all your money in Bitcoin and once a month sell just enough of it to transfer into your local fiat currency, whether that's the U.S. dollar or the Thai bot, and pay your bills. And over a four-year period, you know that that Bitcoin's going to rise in value tremendously. Now, that's what I'm betting on. You know, now people say, well, you could be in the stock market. Yeah, sure. You can be in the S&P 500. Those companies are going up in the S&P 500 because the value of the dollars are going down. Your purchasing power since 2020, when Joe Biden took office in January 2020, the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, by some estimations, has dropped 23%. And just check the price of your home insurance in the United States and your car insurance and what does it cost to buy a, a steak or a dozen eggs, some milk. It's all went up because the value of the currencies went down. You know, in real life, everything's deflationary, not inflationary. Every All prices actually drop to the minimal cost of production. And does it actually, does anybody actually think it costs more to have a dozen eggs now than it did a hundred years ago? Are chickens more expensive? Is transportation to get the eggs to market worse? Eggs cost so much money now compared to 100 years ago because the money is not worth as much. Still says $1. But it doesn't buy what $1 did. In 1962, when my parents bought a three-bedroom, two-bathroom home with a two-car garage on an acre of land in Cincinnati, they paid $13,000 U.S. dollars. It was a custom-built home, brand new. Brick construction. 
what would be considered a really nice home for today. 13,000 US dollars. That house is worth 250, 280,000 US dollars now. The house is uh, 58, 64 years old. Somewhere in that neighborhood, 62, 38, 58, 62 years old. You think a 62-year-old brick house is worth more than it was when it was new? Went from $13,000 to two hundred eighty, two hundred ninety thousand $290,000 is what I estimate that house is worth today? Really? It's not worth more. It's just that the people who want to buy it have to give more dollars because the dollars are worth that much less. How much is the U.S. dollar debased since 1962? 1962, where well, you could buy a brand new Corvette, top of the line Chevrolet for $4,000. How much is a top of the line Chevrolet Corvette today? Now, admittedly, that's not apples to apples because the Corvette today is a lot nicer than the Corvette from 1962. But it's not the only thing. The house is the perfect example. It's the same house in excellent condition, but it was in excellent condition when it was brand new. It's still in excellent condition. But, you know, what does it cost? 30 times as much? 25 times as much? Because the dollar is worth one thirtieth of what it used to be. Maybe the purchasing power of a nineteen sixty two dollars was a nineteen sixty two dollar in nineteen sixty two was thirty times higher. It was still backed by gold till nineteen seventy one. Just saying, if you want to retire early, do your research. Do your own research. But living on fiat currency is literally allowing fiscal policy in whatever country you got your money if it's in the banks, it's allowing them to imply their fiscal and financial policies literally robbing you of your future. Robbing you. And that's one more good thing about living on Bitcoin standard. You can literally keep it in your head. If you want, there's all kinds of methods to secure it where that money can't be taken. The U.S. government can't get my Bitcoin. I guess if they strap me down to a chair and cut off my fingers one by one, I'll be willing to cough up what it takes for them to take it after begging them to kill me first. But that's it. Now, if they want the money in my bank account, and I do have bank accounts still in the United States, if they wanted it, they can seize it. Just ask Putin and Russia. Ask Iran. Hell, ask Nigel Farage. I mean, if a government wants your money and it's sitting in a bank, government just comes and seizes it. Takes it, freezes it. Can't get my Bitcoin. If I want to go from here to another country, that Bitcoin goes with me. It's right up here in my brain. That's the best case scenario. They're not going to be able to seize it. It's the most secure network in the world. 
backed by hundreds of thousands of computers all over the world. Not attackable. Not stoppable. See, I mean, that's why the government really hates Bitcoin. You've heard of, of currency controls. They don't want you. You know, it's against the law in China to take more than $50,000 out of China. Why do you think they banned Bitcoin? Once they put it in Bitcoin, China's lost it. China can't stop it. They may be able to kill the person, but they can't get the Bitcoin. They can't get it back. They can't keep it from leaving or somebody else using it. If you want to be a sovereign individual that retires in life with a little bit of feeling like you can sleep at night and not have to worry about the global reset or banks failing or the government just imposing more taxes and say, we're going to, you know, my biggest nightmare, and this may sound unfeasible, but if things get bad enough, if the debt gets bad enough, we've seen dozens and dozens of executive orders in the United States where they just say, we're doing this by executive order. What if they decide that, hey, we're going to pay off some of the national debt. We're going to just take X percent, 10, 15, 20, 30 whatever they want, of every single financial account in the United States we're taking. We're just going to order every single bank and brokerage house and wirehouse, and we're just going to order them to, to hold 30% and remit it to the U.S. government because we say so. Think that don't happen? Look up your history in Greece. The government can do what it wants. They got an army that says they can do what they want. Without a military, no empire like the United States would have ever grown to prominence. They want your money. They could take it. Now, there'd be a backlash. There might be a civil outrage, but it doesn't stop them from doing what they want to do. Now, maybe they get stopped by the Supreme Court or somebody later. But if they want to lock up your money, they can lock it up. If you want to be a free, sovereign individual... That becomes next to impossible with Bitcoin. Maybe you don't want to go on Bitcoin standard where you got so much in Bitcoin and very little in banks and other things. Eh, don't. Do your research. I'm just bringing it out that after I've done hundreds and hundreds of hours worth of research, it seems to make sense to me you know, but maybe you're retired and you say, well, maybe we take 10% and we just take 10% put in Bitcoin, probably go up in value over the next four or five years. And worst case scenario is we got a rainy day fund. People used to buy gold and save gold in case of an emergency. Bury it in their backyard, put it in bank safety deposit boxes, having safes in their basement, dug into the floor, and they buy themselves, you know, 5% of their liquid assets and they, they keep it in gold. Because gold's beautiful as far as you can't destroy it. You can't destroy gold in a fire. It might melt, but it'll be just a big old blob of gold. It's still worth a lot of money. So... That's why gold is a store of value. Problem is, it's damn heavy. 
to really take any real amount of money in gold, it's hard to it's hard to move, it's heavy to move, costs a lot, it's hard to defend and protect. Somebody can steal all your gold pretty easy if they can come in and cut the safe open or jerk the safe off the wall or wherever you got it. So anyway, this is the example of how I made a mistake because at the time I wasn't 100% committed to a Bitcoin standard. I've been doing research. I've been buying Bitcoin every single day for years, but I hadn't given up totally on the fiat standard and moved to a total Bitcoin standard yet. And I'm still moving that way. I haven't totally arrived at my destination yet. I can't say that I'm 100% happy where I am. And in the United States, the tax laws have you hamstrung to a point where it can take you a few years to even adjust yourself unless you want to pay a lot of, of gains and, and taxes all at one time that jumps you into the highest tax bracket, and that doesn't make a lot of sense. But you can, you can slowly take one foot and put it in front of the other and get there and, and get you know, in a better position than you were. So, you find that most people on Bitcoin Standard aren't the, in the United States. They've made it tougher through all their laws. After all, the United States is the only country in the world that taxes its citizens, whether you are there or not, whether you take advantage of their services or not. They tax you anywhere they can. To be honest, I think we're just a, we're just a walking asset to the United States. They don't give a damn about us. They just want to make sure we give them earnings so they can spend it the way they want, give it away to who they want, buy whatever votes they want. To start whatever war they want to promote. Anyway, Thanks for watching. Please leave a comment, like, share, do all that stuff. I hope you found some interesting thoughts here. I'm expecting I should get some comments. And if you actually made it all the way to the end of this 30-minute video on investing in a car versus renting a car on the Bitcoin standard, then please leave me a comment and say, I, I actually listened to it all. And then think about it. Take yourself a cup of coffee tomorrow. Sit down and listen to the birds sing. And give it some thought. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? How much do you trust your government? Do you think that your money's safe in banks? Do you trust everything to your bank and to your brokerage? Surely your brokerage wouldn't go belly up and you lose all your money. Oh, wait a second. Lehman Brothers. Hmm. Been another six or eight of them where went belly up if the U.S. government went and printed a bunch of money to save them. And one last thought. Gross domestic product. If you remove deficit spending from the federal government out of the gross domestic product, we would have had negative GDP growth for years. The trillions that they spend prop up GDP. Country's not doing as well as you think. But if you can print the money and then distribute it out to the people to spend, by God, it looks like things are popping. Things are great. Have a good one. That's all, folks.